Luis Elizondo made a Himalayan blunder during his exclusive interview with Ross Coulthard on Friday, August 23, 2024. By mentioning a vibrant and responsible democracy such as India in the same breath as a dictatorship like North Korea, Elizondo trivialized robust and time-tested Indo-U.S. relations spanning decades. To merely say Liu's observation was shocking would be an understatement because of the high-ranking positions he has held in his career. Let's get to the full story. It promised to be a path-breaking interview that would offer gobsmacking revelations about the UFO subject, enough to boggle the mind of even die-hard skeptics. Buoyed by tantalizing teasers that News Nation let trickle prior to the actual broadcast, millions of excited UFO enthusiasts around the world waited with bated breath. Alas, broadcast of the interview was delayed. I think I know why, but I'll get to it in due course. Anyway, the delay caused much consternation among eager fans, especially because Elizondo had appeared on The Joe Rogan Show a day earlier, where he discussed many aspects of UAP or Unidentified Anomalous Phenomena, and also his latest book, Imminent, Inside the Pentagon's Hunt for UFOs. Australian investigative journalist Ross Coulthart had created a worldwide sensation in June 2023 when he interviewed David Grush, who made incredible claims on the UAP subject, during which he introduced the words non-human biologics and non-human intelligence into the UFO lexicon. This time around, in what was touted as another bonanza for UFO enthusiasts, Ross brought former Pentagon official and UAP proponent Luis Lu Elizondo to the hot seat in a News Nation program, Confessions of a UFO Hunter. Elizondo, a U.S. Army veteran and one-time head of the Pentagon's Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program, or ATIP, a secretive program which studied UFOs, or UAPs as they are now called, touched upon an array of topics encompassing the phenomena. This exhaustive list included the U.S. government's knowledge of non-human intelligences, classified programs to capture and reverse-engineer extraterrestrial craft, the study of alien specimens recovered in these crashes, strange implants found in the bodies of abductees, the stymied military exercise by the Pentagon to lure and capture a UAP, the possible origin of UFOs, and the all-important question, are non-human intelligences extraterrestrials or cryptoterrestrials? No new proof was offered for these stunning revelations, save for the one about alien implants, which has already been contested by noted UFO skeptic Mick West, who also claimed to have found several glaring errors in Elizondo's book, Imminent. The frustration among sections of the online community was palpable. Users commented to the interview in droves, declaring they were fed up at not being shown any real evidence, but only regurgitated tales and hearsay that was presented as fact. The reason I decided to make this video has solely to do with Elizondo's response to Ross's question about whether extraterrestrials are benevolent or otherwise. Watch this clip. There are many commentators who say that the non-human beings, the aliens, call them what you like, they're friendly. If they're real, they're, they're no threat at all to humanity. Well, I, I think in order to understand if something is a threat, from a national security perspective, it's a very simple calculus. It's capabilities versus intent. We have examples where these things have disabled our nuclear capabilities, right? Like we see with Maelstrom Air Force Base and whatnot, where entire flights of our nuclear, part of our nuclear triad, has been taken offline, right? Nowhere did they stop our advancement from atomic technology development to nuclear technology. They didn't stop us testing weapons out in Nevada, and they didn't stop the proliferation of nuclear weapons from getting into the hands of other countries that are unfriendly, of countries like North Korea, and now India has them. I ask you, if these things are benevolent, why haven't they stopped that? There's zero information to suggest that they are, what they are doing is for benevolent reasons.
I was mortified to hear Elizondo categorize India, the mother of democracy and an ally of the United States, as unfriendly. Worse, he clubbed the country along with North Korea, a dictatorship that has been viewed by the U.S. as a rogue state since long. Given that the News Nation interview was telecast globally, with the clip I referred to still available online on Twitter and YouTube, I shudder to think about the negative message that was conveyed, particularly among those who may not have a clue about India or the strong relationship she shares with the United States. Doesn't Elizondo appreciate the fact that India, a nation sandwiched between two hostile nuclear-armed countries, is a stabilizing force in Asia? Were it not for India acting as a bulwark against nefarious players in the region, China's global hegemonic ambitions could not have been contained. Yet, Elizondo made a flippant, demeaning observation, devoid of even basic understanding of geopolitics. As a seasoned journalist, why didn't Ross Coulthart stop Lou in his tracks and correct the wholly bizarre, factually incorrect statement he made about India? This was most disappointing, to say the least. Now is a good time to view a few short clips of visits to the United States by Indian Prime Ministers, beginning with Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru in 1949, a mere two years after India gained independence from British rule. For her part, India accorded a warm welcome to U.S. presidents who visited the country, starting with Dwight D. Eisenhower in 1959. Thank you. 
As you have just seen, the two nations, the world's oldest and largest democracies, have shared a great bond over several decades. Sure, there have been ups and downs, but the lows have never lasted long enough to fester to a point of no return. Let's briefly see a few examples of Indo-US cooperation in the realm of space exploration. India's National Space Agency, the Indian Space Research Organization, or ISRO, and America's National Aeronautics and Space Administration, NASA, have successfully collaborated closely in various spheres of space exploration over several years. Take for instance the recent NASA ISRO Synthetic Aperture Radar, or NISAR mission. This joint project, which aims to co-develop and launch a dual-frequency synthetic aperture radar on an Earth observation satellite, will be sent into orbit in early 2025. With NISAR, we're tracking the changes of the solid Earth and how it's moving. Ecosystems, ice cover, and any other thing that's changing at the scale of a centimeter on the Earth in a way that we've never been able to see before. Because of these very subtle motions we can measure, we're able to understand what's happening below the surface of the Earth at great precision. Scientists want to study the movements of the Earth's surface uh, to understand the processes that could trigger earthquakes, volcanoes, and landslides. And that allows us then to understand risks associated with natural hazards. Which in turn can help in mitigation measures and early response. Other changes over the Earth's surface include melting of glaciers and ice sheets, changes in forest biomass, soil moisture, and shoreline changes. NISAR is quite unique in that it has two radars, one provided by NASA, one provided by ISRO, the Indian Space Research Organization. NASA and ISRO have collaborated in this mission. Till last year we were there at JPL, NASA where the radars got integrated and tested and were shipped back to India now. The spacecraft is getting integrated with the instruments and they are being tested together. NISR is going to be launched from Srihari Kota, which is a ISRO launch pad and it is going to be launched by GSLV Mark II. So we are just looking forward for the launch of uh, NISAR in the forthcoming year. Now it looks like we are no more uh, belonging to two different worlds and we all belong to the space community, that's it. There's the excitement about what we are gonna learn that we didn't even anticipate we we're gonna learn. Named after the Sanskrit words Chandra, meaning moon, and Yana, meaning craft or vehicle, Chandrayaan-1, the first Indian deep space mission was launched in October 2008 to study the moon under various parameters. Apart from the country's indigenous instruments, Chandrayaan-1 carried scientific equipment from the United States, the United Kingdom, Germany, Sweden, and Bulgaria. In August 2013, this mission made the astonishing announcement of finding evidence of water molecules locked in mineral grains on the moon's surface. Does the U.S. collaborate with so-called unfriendly countries in this manner, Mr. Elizondo? While I'm tempted to list the hundreds of exceptional trailblazing achievements of ISRO over the years, such as India being the only nation to successfully land a spacecraft in the lunar South Pole region, I've decided to stick only with those involving close U.S. cooperation. In September 2009, Chandrayaan-1, took photos of the Apollo 15 landing site and tracks of the lunar rovers. In addition to this, the uncrewed lunar orbiter also captured images of Apollo 11 and 12, which was a blow to moon landing deniers. Bob Balaram is a NASA employee of Indian origin. He's not just any employee. As the chief engineer, he guided Ingenuity, NASA's ambitious miniature robot helicopter during its historic flight above the dusty surface of Mars in early 2021. Interestingly, Bob's passion for space science birthed when as a 10-year-old he heard the live broadcast of the moon landing on radio in 1969. Would the U.S. hand over the controls of even a simple drone to someone deemed an enemy, let alone a robot helicopter on another planet, Mr. Elizondo? Why, even Professor Stephen Hawking, 
was able to impart his infinite wisdom to the world thanks to a computer program developed by two Indian scientists. Watch this clip. Yet if as I hope, basic science becomes part of general awareness, what now appear as the paradoxes of quantum theory will seem as just common sense to our children's children. Stephen Hawking wrote over 25 books, continued to teach at Cambridge University, appeared across popular TV shows, and gave us the most comprehensive understanding of cosmology. How did he manage that despite his degenerative condition of ALS? Through different computer programs that helped him communicate. One such program called Elocutor was developed by two Indian engineers, Dr. Arun Mehta and Vikram Krishna. The list of Indian scientists who have made sterling contributions while working with international teams, especially from the US, in joint space exploration and other ventures, is so vast that it will require a separate video on the subject. India conducted its first successful nuclear test way back in May 1974. But by irresponsibly stating even an unfriendly country such as India has nuclear weapons now, Elizondo makes it appear we achieved the feat a month or two ago in some clandestine manner. India's nuclear doctrine is based on a no-first-use policy, which states that the country will only use nuclear weapons in retaliation for a nuclear attack on Indian territory or forces. And we're clubbed with North Korea? Perhaps Elizondo either forgot or is blissfully unaware that Mahatma Gandhi, the apostle of peace and non-violence who has inspired hundreds of leaders across generations in the U.S. and elsewhere in the world, was an Indian. It is also baffling that being a former army man, Elizondo doesn't know that India and the United States have a rich history of joint military exercises, including those involving the tri-services in each other's countries stretching back decades. Here's a tip. Please conduct Google searches for Tiger Triumph, Yud Abhyas, Tarkash, and Vajra Prahar. Hey Marine Sergeant Samantha Bray here. Marines with 3rd Marine Division had the opportunity to test their amphibious readiness capabilities this weekend along with Indian Army soldiers during Exercise Tiger Triumph. Tiger Triumph improves U.S.-Indian partnership, readiness, and joint operational capabilities. The exercise took place aboard the USS Germantown while underway in the Bay of Bengal. Tiger Triumph gives the U.S. Marine Corps and Indian forces the opportunity to work together, exchange knowledge, and learn from each other in a range of military operations such as humanitarian assistance, disaster relief, and amphibious operations. Through exercises like this, the Marine Corps remains a constant force in readiness, standing by to respond at any time or place. And that's your Marine Minute. It is perplexing that Elizondo is uninformed about such crucial bilateral exercises, even though he is often introduced as someone who served in counterintelligence and counterterrorism worldwide. Would he then even know that the U.S. Congress designated India a major defense partner in 2016? Remember I told you at the outset that I guessed why the News Nation broadcast was delayed? It might in all probability have to do with Elizondo's gaffe about India. And they didn't stop the proliferation of nuclear weapons from getting into the hands of other countries that are unfriendly, of countries like North Korea, and now India has them. That segment has been removed from the full interview. However, since it is still available online, see the description section, I urge News Nation to delete the clip forthwith. Thank you.